Welcome inside the WOSN studios. Thank you for joining us for another week of Press Row. We've got Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz, and I'm Matt Finkel. Both baseball postseason already underway. The softball postseason will be getting started this week. Give me a surprise team to look out for as we make our way towards that first weekend in June with the girls in Akron and the boys in Columbus. I'll, I'll throw a couple out there. Not, you know, a, a long shot or a, a sleeper is kind of subjective, I guess. But uh, I, I think Shawnee softball could be a sleeper because uh, b things out of their control, they kind of fell back in the pack and the rest of the leaders in the WBL went ahead. But with Alyssa Windau back and capable of throwing a perfect game as she did recently. And, and a home way, run in the same game. The way they can hit, yeah. uh, they could be a sleeper in softball. So. You know, not that anybody thought at the beginning of the season they wouldn't be good, but as the season played out, maybe now they're a little under the radar. You took my softball. I had, right. I had, saw, I had uh, Shawnee there. But baseball, I'm going to say Wapakoneta. You know, even though, you know, they've had a solid season, you know, that could be that team that maybe sneaks up in that loaded district that maybe is the one that does get through. So I'm going to say the Wapak baseball program. I like Minster Wildcats as being perhaps a, a sleeper team. They were in the middle of the pack of the very, very competitive MAC. And when you get into the baseball tournament, you've got a hot pitcher. Anything could happen. I think Minster could be a team that could make some noise. And I think Forward Recovery is another team that we haven't really talked about a whole lot this mm -hmm. year. They went to the state tournament a season ago, a young team a year ago. Now they're very much a, a veteran team. I think Forward Recovery has slipped under the radar a little bit. I don't know if they would count as underdogs, but Kaleida, I think, has a team that is built for a deep tournament run. They had that big showdown with Miller City last week for the PCL title essentially, and, and they won that game pretty easily. They might play Miller City again in the postseason. Looking forward to that one. But Shawnee softball, like you said, the Alyssa Window injury really put a hamper on their regular season. Right. And in talking to Coach Truxell, they haven't made it out of the district in a while. So this could be the year. But Wapakoneta is also the, the favorite right now, and that could be a good district final between those two, two teams. All right, let's talk basketball now. The PCL coaching carousel has stopped spinning. We've got a handful of new coaches. Who are you most intrigued by? Well, I, I, that's easy for me. It's a, the Kaleida situation. Uh, anytime you replace a, a legend, it, I think that's where the most intrigue is. And, and you have a guy that's been at other places in the PCL. This seems to be a common story throughout history. Uh, Ryan Stechel, he played at Fort Jennings. He coached at Columbus Grove, and now he's been living in Kaleida, and now he'll be coaching at Kaleida. So uh, I think that has built-in intrigue, not that there aren't other interesting situations, but to me that has to come to the top. I'm going to say the job that Ryan Stecksholdy is leaving in Columbus Grove. Now, granted, Ryan took the 2015 season um, as a leave of absence, more or less. He was back with the team, helping out and assisting with practices and stuff back towards the later half of the year. But Eric Mag ran that team. He ran practices. Everything was how Coach Mag wanted it. Will this be his job, or will they go outside of the system and bring somebody in, or will somebody say, hey, you know, that Grove job really intrigues me again? And, you know, consider that. I don't foresee that being the case, but it's either going to be Eric Mag or it's going to be an outsider that takes over. So who takes over for Steck Schulte? 67 wins in, you know, four years as the head coach. Pretty impressive, not including last year's record, which was 11 wins and like 12 losses. I think they only played one game in the tournament before they got bounced. So, you know, what happens at Columbus Grove as these dominoes start to fall into place in the PCL? Lipsick with Chris Coleman, I think that's just a step over on the bench. Um, you know, I've known Chris for a while. He's a good guy. I think he'll do a good job at Lipsick. 21 team, and they've got a lot of juniors that could come up and possibly contend for the PCL title as seniors next year. The intriguing situation I see is about four or five miles east of Columbus Grove on Route 12, Pandora Gilboa, where you got Joe Bradick returning to the Rocket bench. Now, was it four or five years ago, he had the Rockets contending for that PCL title, stepped back, did some coaching on the college level as an assistant, a wealth of basketball knowledge, and has got Joe Bradick back on that PG bench. 
I, I think the Rockets are a team that are primed to have a resurgence under Joe Bradick. I think what will help Coach Bradick at PG is he never left the school system. He stayed as a teacher at PG. He knows these kids, so he's already got a leg up on round three, I believe this is, uh, for Coach Bradick. Um, you know, coming in, and he's going to know, you know, having spent some time with Guy Neal at the college level, he probably picked up on some things as well that he might be able to implement and integrate into the uh, Rocket basketball program. Can you guys remember a time going into a basketball season where you had at least four new coaches in one league? 14, no. 14 years ago, the Northwest Conference had three, and all three of the guys are still in their current positions. Okay. So that'd probably be the closest. I figured it would be kind of rare to have that many new coaches, but, you know, I haven't been here as long as you guys. So Crestview, Spencerville, know. and Ada. I, I think maybe if we really looked at the, the BVC, I think there's probably been some years, yeah. particularly the lower half of the BVC, the smaller schools, where you, you oftentimes have coaching change like that. But, you know, for, for years, obviously, with quarter cracks, you had a really stability in the Putnam County League where you had guys at a school for six, seven, eight years. And we're not seeing that and anywhere for a lot of different reasons. But yeah, this is certainly going to be a year of change for PCL basketball. Count, counting Eric Mag, I did the math this morning. Counting Eric Mag, if he does become the head coach, it would technically be his second year as the head coach at Columbus Grove. If he is the, if, his, if everything holds serve, it would be a combined 21 years of coach as far as the ten combined tenure at the PCL schools. King, of course, had 41 by himself, just at Kaleida. <laughs> just at Kaleida. Right. Just right. at Kaleida. All right, let's go to the NBA now. The Cavs, another sweep. They're into the conference finals, and it's either the Raptors or the Heat. So if you're the Cavs and you're LeBron James, do you want your old team or do you want the team from Canada? Well, I, I don't want to speak for LeBron or for the Cavaliers, but I'll speak for me. I don't want them to play the Heat. I don't want to see him and Dwayne Wade kiss and make up or play buddy buddy. That'll nauseate me. So the, ma so the magic the Isaiah type thing from back where they'd kiss yeah, each other. I, on the team. I don't need it. I mean, I know LeBron, Dwayne Wade are pals. I get it. I don't want to be nauseated with it. I hope it's the Raptors. The NBA and TNT and ESPN and every other media conglomerate wants it to be Heat, Cavs, so they can jam it down our throat. Well, that's for another our reason I don't want it. That being said. The Cavaliers don't care who it is. They're playing their best basketball of the season right now. They proved it in the Atlanta series. They're like, hey, bring them on. We'll turn them into chump stains. I don't think either Toronto or Miami will be appreciably better. I don't think either one will prepare the Cavaliers any better for whoever they're going to meet in the NBA Finals. If you enjoy the theatricals of it all, then, yeah, root for the Miami Heat because that is going to be – a lot of hype over seemingly nothing. If you just want some boring basketball and maybe see a Canadian rapper sitting in the front row, then you root for Toronto. <laughs> I was just going to say something about Drake. Yeah, you know, if you want to see Drake there, then you root for Toronto as well. But, you know, Drake will go, be, go sit on Cal Perry's bench and be in Kentucky and hang out with them during some summer trip or something instead. All right, so then let me ask you this about the West. Who gives the Warriors, presum presuming they advance to the conference finals over Portland, who gives them the better series? Is it... Oklahoma City or San Antonio? And, of course, the Thunder have a 3-2 lead right now. Right now it's OKC. Is it? Right I still now. think it's San Antonio. I I'm kind I, of hoping the Spurs win the next two. Days. I predict San Antonio, but they've got to go game six in OKC. Mm -hmm. That's where I think momentum yeah, clearly rides uh, with the Thunder. And, you know, if this, is, if this is the end in game six in Oklahoma City, you know, will probably be the ride off into the sunset for Duncan Possibly Ginobili. You mean he hasn't already ridden off in the sunset? Well, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't see him playing a whole lot in some of these games so okay. far. He's got to play more than 12 minutes to be noticed and actually score a bucket, too. Uh, you know, you wonder if uh, maybe we're finally witnessing the full coalescing and rise of Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook as a tandem. I think many people would argue that it's hard to beat them if they're both playing as well as they can and functioning as a team with everybody around them. Could we be witnessing their ascension? I think they're very dangerous. I, I, obviously, the Spurs are very capable as well, but I think OKC may be dynamic enough to give the Warriors a challenge. I was listening to a syndicated talk show host earlier today before we taped this, and he said he compared OKC and San Antonio to MJ with the Bulls and the Pistons. They had to get over that hump. He says OKC has to get over I'm sorry, didn't hump. the Thunder go to the finals a couple years ago? They did. 
So what hump are we talking about? As far as the Spurs slash Warriors slash all that. They already thing. got past them two years ago. Did well, they beat the Spurs that year in the playoffs? Yeah, they did. Did they? In the Western Conference Finals, six games. That was LeBron's first ring, if I remember correctly? Second. Okay. I think it was, it was two years ago, 2014. Oklahoma City, though, has to have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. And, and it's somewhat deserved, the knock on them. They've always seemed to not quite live up to what we thought they could be. But, you know, sometimes things happen and you don't really notice them until they've almost already happened. This could be one of those things. I, I don't know that they can eliminate the Spurs, but I think we may be seeing something really developing here. If OKC knocks off Golden State, get ready for a new batch of Billy Donovan's the greatest coach ever stories. Yep. <laughs> We've already heard a couple. That's... Just this 3-2 lead over Pop when he outcoached him in game five. Everyone's like, you know, I'm seeing the stories. So. Well, very interesting. If you look at the coaches left, if OKC does win, you've got a rookie in Donovan, a second year or third year guy in Kerr. Second. Yeah. Second year. You got well, Teron Liu. A year Lue. and a half guy because he missed the first half of the season. Right. Yeah. Teron Liu, less than six months. Uh, it, it's amazing uh, that it could come down to that. And if it's Toronto, it would be a second or third year coach there. And you got Spolster, who'd be the most tenured <laughs> of all of those guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. That LeBron's the most tenured of the head coach. Well, well, you already know you've, it got, too. <laughs> you've got all that talent on, on the floor with these final four teams we're going to have. Maybe I could coach. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. All right. Major League Baseball now. Some teams not going, their seasons are not going the way they had hoped, which means the managers are on the hot seat. So which manager is on the hottest seat right now? <laughs> Aaron? Is it your boy? It's our boy. Yeah. Brad Osmus yeah. is as yeah. good as toast because the, the Tigers are in a tailspin and they, they, I don't think they're going to figure their way out of it. Whatever's going I'm not a big fire the manager guy, but something's not right. They're not that bad. Uh, to me, they've got guys not playing to the level they should be. Uh, their fundamentals are bad. Their attitude seems bad. Hey, it's early in the year, whatever. I, I think Osmus is gone myself. I, I would rather see them struggle early than late, but some of the mistakes that they've made have been inexcusable. I think it's Freddie Gonzalez, guys, in Atlanta. No. So, the Braves knew what they were getting into this year. They knew they were going to be an awful team this season. All the Braves are doing are waiting until they can move to the suburbs and get their new park in their building for the future. Gonzalez is safe for the same reason Brian Price is safe in Cincinnati. They knew what they were signing up for. I'm with Todd. Osmus is the guy that's on the hottest seat. And you look at, you got Gene Lamont on that staff. You got Kirk Gibson as a broadcast. You got Lloyd McClendon in AAA Toledo. So you got three all guys. All former skippers. All former you skippers. You got Tram in the easy, front office. And Tram. All, you got four guys who could easily step in and be that interim manager. You also have a fifth that's in that office, too, on a part time Jim basis, Leland. traveling around. Oh, good old Jimmy Smokes. <laughs> yeah. Jimbo's not doing anything yeah. until the World Baseball Classic. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> He's not doing anything either. And he came out the other day. And actually, in defense of Brad Osmus, said Brad's doing a good job. Yes, the seat is very, very warm in Detroit. Terry Foster wrote about it in the Free Press on Tuesday, as a matter of fact, saying it's time to cut the cord. Had they not law, had they not won the game Tuesday night over Washington, and then turn around and lose this afternoon, they're playing as we tape this show and have another sweep. I think there's no questions asked. Osmus would be fired. Not quite at the Lane Kiffin level as soon as he gets off the plane <laughs> to get to the bus. But I think it would have been get back to Copa, get their cars and stuff like that, and then the proverbial thanks for playing would have been offered. Ospice it's probably ought, coming. Osmus ought to be grateful that the Nationals won that Monday night game in the ninth inning because if that game would have gone extra innings, Tigers had nobody left on the bench because of bad managing yes. of Brad Osmus. I, I don't – I will say right now, Osmus will – if they survive, he survives this, he will not be back next year. Uh, you know, you brought up the Freddie Gonzalez situation, and you're right in that the Braves knew they're awful. Right. But sometimes when things get so bad in a season, you can a guy anyway just to do something. Now the question is, do they really think Freddie Gonzalez can manage this team when they plan on being good? If they don't, they may fire him just for something to do. Uh, I think Brian Price is safe, though. I think Red's management have shown a little more patience with managers over the years. And I don't know that he'll be the long-term guy, but I'm pretty sure he'll finish this season. Reds come in today at 14 and 19, only five under right now. I mean, It you seems have, worse than it, what it, it is. Because the Cubs are so far right. in advance yeah, right. everybody. Cubs. But, you know, if you look, if you just said to a Reds fan, 14 and 15, five under right now, and not had the bullpen issues, they'd have been like, 
okay, maybe we yeah. don't stink as yeah, bad. Yeah, just a couple weeks we ago, right. we were kind of excited about the effort they were showing mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah. a little bit of promise, but that went away pretty quick. We're only a quarter of the way through the season. There's a lot of time remaining, which if you're going to make a move, better do it now so that you can try and salvage what's left of the season. And obviously, with having that second wild card in play, that allows more teams to stay in the race, and you can continue to think you're in the race sure. a little bit longer, which might forestall making a move. But it also might trigger the move sooner because uh, we can't far any if we can't fall any further back. Let's make that move now. All right, let's close. We've got about a minute left. So give me a summer movie you're looking forward to or would like to rip on in the 60 seconds because you're sick of the sequels and you're sick of the, the well, superheroes. I, I looked it, some of these movies up in preparation for this. I couldn't believe some of these movies. They're making a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie? I thought that <laughs> yeah, was from like the 90s. Isn't, yeah, aren't it's they gone? Animated. Is that still a, a thing? They're, they've promoted the toy aspect and stuff. I have an 8-year-old. <laughs> I can tell you that much. The, oh, the there you go. Stuff, yeah. But, uh, I'm not really entwined about any of these movies. Why are they? Why they'd end another Independence Day is beyond me. If I had to pick one that I had to go see, it'd be Suicide Squad. Okay, Mark. I would much rather see a movie in December that's going to be a good movie than any of the recycled junk they put out in the summer. I'll let your boy. I'll give a quick endorsement for Andy Samberg's movie Pop Star: Never Stop, Never Stopping, which seems like it could be the next Spinal Ooh. Tap. Ooh. <laughs> I saw the previews. That was brutal. I that's, love Spinal Tap. I love a good satire. There so you go. Tonight, I'm going to rock you tonight. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're turning it up to 11 as we close out this week's Press Row. Thank you very much for joining us. Enjoy your games this weekend. We'll see you next week.